center of the universe with billions of stars, millions and millions of constellations, all under his control. Do you think that for a moment he's unable to deal with you in your life at this moment? He is so capable. He is so amazing. He is so powerful. He is so loving. He has not forgotten in the vastness of his creation he has not forgotten you. And he has not forgotten me. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, this morning we stand in your awesome presence. We are surrounded by angels that we cannot see. We are moved and stirred and alive because of your Holy Spirit. So we come to you to worship. We gathered from all over the place for this moment, for the time when we can surrender our worry to you. We can surrender our concerns and our diseases and our health to you. We can surrender our sin to you at the foot of the cross. And you invite us to stand in your presence holy and acceptable as living sacrifices to be used by you. So that is my prayer for us this morning, that we will be immensely aware of what it means to hear your voice, respond in faith, and obey you and walk with you, the creator of the universe. You have said you are the light of the world. And then you turn to us and you've told us that we are the light of the world. Help us to hear your word and respond to you this morning in light of who you are and where you have called us to be. I pray for those who are sick those who just can't seem to get over the hump, for those who are worried about money, for those who are worried about sending their kids into the fray in the name of Jesus. It's worth everything. Bless us this morning, I pray. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. I just want to say, Christy, Thanks for coming, because this is exciting for me. I love this. Um, you are launching Christie into the world of study and academics to counter that culture with faith. And she's come to tell you her story. We're going to anoint her afterwards and send her out. And then you get to sign checks and give money. Is that fair enough? I'm being very straightforward. So I hope this doesn't embarrass send her, send her this week because she's needed on campus. And so listen to what she has to say. Christy, welcome, and God bless you as you come to share. I am excited to be here today um, to look out to see uh, many faces that I've known um, when I was uh, a youth. Um, I came here in ninth grade, and I was here for the rest of my high school career, and then came in and out between gallivanting many different places um, and doing different forms of ministry. So um, it's, it's a true joy, um, just even just thinking, um, praying before I came up here, just to, joy overwhelmed me to remember the ways that the Lord has been good to plant seeds of really deep seeds of faith and to have people, some in this room, um, disciple me and walk alongside me in very formative seasons. And so when I see these children come up, and I remember also the groves of children that would come up when I was here, I think, what is God going to do in their lives? And how is he going to walk them into the destiny that he has for them? And how are people going to be changed by that? And one day, they'll probably be on a college or a university campus. And who's going to walk alongside them? So I'm really excited to be here. It was actually through uh, the youth group here that I received my call to ministry. I went to an Acquire the Fire at 16, 
And uh, the Lord spoke to me, and he said that you are going to affect thousands of people with my truth. And recently, the Lord has been reminding me of that word, um, specifically that it's we need to be careful not to forget what truth is and to be pressing into the word of God, both the written word of God and the written word of God. And also, um, you know, at times that means defending the faith. At times that means, um, you know, pushing back on something that doesn't line up uh, with what we know to be true. And so I have been recently challenged um, that my call is specifically to be someone that both speaks truth but lives truthfully. So I'm very grateful to be here and to be supported by mm -hmm. this church. And I hope that I can reconnect with many of you uh, relationally and hearing what the Lord's been doing in your life to share stories of goodness. Today I thought what we do is a little maybe different than what you're used to. Um, give you a glimpse of what happens when we're on campus and how we reach students with um, the Word of God. So we do a lot of study. Um, and for some of you, who's, who's familiar with inductive Bible study method? Okay, just a few people. Okay. And maybe as we go through, it might actually be something you know, just maybe not by that term. Um, but we tend to, um, two nights a week, go on res floors, and uh, those res floors are um, a student will open up their, their floor because there's key passes. You can't just go on wherever you want. And they'll say, yeah, I want to be a host of a Bible study um, so that my friends and, and people I don't know yet can come and can study the Bible. And so in an academic environment, we also then do a study um, that is somewhat methodical. Um, that helps them get into the Word, but then also to ask questions of themselves and really apply. Um, so just to give you a brief summary of what InterVarsity is about before I jump into that study with you. Um, InterVarsity uh, has a very strong uh, connection in um, shaping by God's Word and led by the Holy Spirit. The purpose of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship of Canada is the transformation of youth, students, and graduates in all their ethnic diversity into fully committed followers of Jesus. And um, I also really enjoy that there is this value in seeing an ethnically diverse uh, group of people on campus um, where they're all uh, invited to ask the questions, what does it mean through my ethnic background to follow Jesus? And so I'm learning a lot in that. Um, in that I did not grow up in a, in a largely di um, diverse population, but now that I live in the inner, inner city, I have had many experiences of that working at the YMCA and now with InterVarsity. So that is um, the mission statement of InterVarsity, and um, I'll share a little bit later afterwards the kinds of things that we do practically uh, within um, mission. So for today, what we're going to do is we're going to study a, a short chapter or portion of scripture in Luke. It's Luke 5, 1 to 11, and if you got a bulletin, I actually printed out the, script, the scripture for you. Uh, this is what we would do with our students. We'd give the scripture to them so that we're all in the same version, and uh, we would study it together. So what I'm going to do is just have the two Britney's stand so that you're ready, and I'm going to read the scripture. You can follow along, and they are going to be signed in Jesus just to try and bring that scripture to life. If you don't have a bulletin, you can raise your hand, and I think someone will give you one as well. But, yeah, but for going further, you can you think of that too. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake, lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats, uh, two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he, sit, then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. 
So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were there were with were there with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. So I invite you today to um, picture that you're in a much smaller setting. Um, you're in uh, basically a community room on a rest floor. Um, it's an open forum in the sense that anyone can walk in and the microwave, sometimes people use it, um, and we do that on purpose. And so we're in this space and we've just read the scripture and now uh, we're going to look at some observations of that scripture. So they'll be up on the screen um, and usually the person facilitating is also a student. So it's uh, one of our student leaders will facilitate the Bible study. Now the question we're going to be asking today is, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Pretty simple question. Maybe one that we would have reconciled a long time ago. But when we look at the scripture, maybe we'll learn something or be reminded of something um, in asking this question. So observations are um, are the where, when, the what happens, the factual things that we see in the passage. Um, and they also, at this point, tend to give a little bit of context to the, to the passage. I encourage you as we go along to keep the scripture um, in front of you, to even look to find where those observations are. Um, we're constantly teaching students how to have these tools for themselves so that they know how to study scripture and how to uh, apply it to their lives. So first of all, we see that Jesus is at the Sea of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, actually. Um, there's many different names for the sea. And that there is a large crowd there. A uh, little note around the sea is that it was very <coughs> prosperous for fishing at this time, so it would have been a very popular place with a lot of fishermen. Um, and we do see that there are other fishermen around um, to help with the large catch of fish. There were two boats that are mentioned in this passage, and they're on the shore, and they're at the end of their shift. So uh, again, fishing tends to be, I know for our in our context, we go at dawn and dusk. They tend to fish all night. <coughs> they come in after the shift, and they're done, and so they're working shift work. They sleep during the day. So they come in <coughs> off the lake, and they're cleaning up their nets, probably pretty tired. Jesus gets into Simon's <coughs> boat and teaches the crowd. So it makes Simon's boat. Jesus instructs Simon to put, the, to put the clean nets back into the water and into the deep water. Okay, so okay, Simon's putting nets into a deep water. Simon informs Jesus of their hard work. We've been out all night. But he also complies. <laughs> I noticed that. <coughs> we notice that the catch of fish begins to break the nets and sink the boats. A lot of fish. I've never had that, seen that many fish. Your dad would be really excited if he saw that many fish. Okay. <laughs> um, Simon is named Simon Peter only once in this passage. So why is that significant? Come back to that. Simon Peter falls at Jesus' knees and confesses his sinfulness. Probably pretty noteworthy. All were amazed at the catch of fish. So. Who is all? The crowd? Who is all? All were amazed. Jesus tells Simon he will catch people <coughs> instead of fish. And lastly, the last observation we see is they left everything to follow. Okay. So, we've looked at some of the key things. By far, this is not all the observations you can make. Usually, we spend about 40, 30 to 40 minutes naming off all these observations. We have English majors and they're thinking of way more things than I can think of. Um, but we've now pulled out a few basic things from the passage. So we move into interpretation. 
So we look at some questions that have come out from the text. And it's really great to hear the questions that the students think of. Because most of the time it's not what I've ever, like, I'm like, I've never even thought of it that way. It's wonderful. Like, the, the scripture becomes alive as you have more people uh, speaking into it. I just thought maybe it would be a little bit too long of a process if we did that here today. So I picked a couple questions. Um, what do we learn about Jesus and Simon in this passage? And what is significant about what they are saying or doing? So that's the first question we're going to look at. Um, the second question is in regards to Simon's first and then second response. But we'll look at the first question. So what do we learn about Jesus? What do we learn about Simon? And to keep it simple for students, we tend not to look at other passages outside just so that we can focus on one. Some of these students, they do not have any biblical background. Actually, they, they come as non-believers. They just are curious, what is this thing about Jesus? Um, I've heard about the Bible, I don't know anything about it. So in order to keep them on track, we actually stay within the passage and we don't try not to make too many references outside so that they feel welcome and that the playing field is pretty equal. So we look at Jesus. Jesus picks Simon. At this point, we start talking about what could be the interpretation of that. Why does Jesus pick Simon's boat and not the other boat? Um, and we see here that Simon had partners. Um, we, um, we understand that Jesus uh, would be, is a teacher. Many people are following him. So um, it could be said that one of the interpretations is Jesus sees Simon's leadership potential. He's a fisherman. There's other fishermen partnering with him. Um, but he also is um, insightful, and we know also the Son of God, so he has that divine aspect. But what we can see here is that Simon <laughs> is picked, um, and, and I don't think by happenstance. Then the next thing we can see is um, he's committed, Jesus is committed to teaching the crowd, so much so that he is going to figure out a creative way to teach these people that are pressing in on him. So he gets into a boat. And he uses natural amphitheater over the water to reach the people. He's committed and he's creative to reach the people. Um, we see here also that Jesus is bold. He's bold to instruct Simon on fishing. And at this point, we may give some context, we may not. Some of the students can speak into it and say, well, we actually know that Jesus grew up as a carpenter. Um, and then some of the other students might be like, oh, really? He doesn't know how to fish? Like, <laughs> these kinds of things. So we see Jesus is bold. And also, he's bold in a sense that, in saying, you know, you need to put into the deep water. The deep water was not the place to fish. It was near the shore that they would fish. So Jesus is trying to give expertise to Simon when Simon is the expert in fishing. What is Jesus doing there? Okay, so um, there's there's some questions there. Sometimes there's uh, suggestions offered, like is Jesus countering Simon's pride? Is he just trying to see if like Simon will try something new? What is Jesus doing there? Jesus mm -hmm. performs a miracle, which reaches Simon, but also everyone else. Okay, so that's pretty big. Obviously, Jesus has something in mind that he wants to do, and he has Simon as, um, as like a target. Miracles cause Simon to address Jesus as Lord. So before, if you look at the text, he calls, Simon says, Master. And Master is a general term for, um, like, general authority. A sense of honoring someone because I know that that person has some authority. Whereas Lord is a very large shift. So we'll come back to that because that's part of his, uh, Simon's response. We see also that Jesus calms Simon's fears. And Jesus gives Simon a new purpose in life. He will catch people. Okay. So those are some of the things that we learn about Jesus in the passage. And those are some of the things that we learn about Simon. And some of them overlap. He's used to a hard fishing life. So we've talked about that because none of us, none of the students are really used to hard labor, um, unless they grew up in on a farm or something like that. Um, so we talk about what would it be like to, you know, you work all night long, sometimes you catch something, sometimes you don't. 
Um, the sea was a very chaotic place. Um, people had a lot of fears around the sea. Um, there was a lot of superstition believed about the sea. Um, so people wouldn't necessarily want to be a fisherman. It was considered a lowly position, similar to like a lowly position of being a shepherd, that kind of thing. Um, so he was used to hard life. He was used to having to be resilient in storms. He was used to ha uh, having to uh, push past obstacles in his life. Um, we see that Simon, or yeah, um, <coughs> Simon calls Jesus master, as we um, as we pointed out before, that he's willing to obey Jesus. Even though, in the text here, we look at it, it says, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. So we talk about, like, what's, what's actually being said here? Like, if you say so, how is that being said? And we'll have a chat with the students about that. And what we've come to in the past is, we feel like Simon actually has, like, a willingness but doesn't really believe it's going to produce much. So there's not belief, but there's a willingness to try, but there's not belief. That's one of the interpretations. So then um, we also see that Simon realizes that Jesus is able to abundantly provide. Okay? He came in with nothing, which means it would affect his, you know, his week, what he needed to buy food, how he needed to live, survive, that kind of thing. And instead, Jesus comes and wows him and changes his experience with abundant provision. <coughs> so that seemed unlikely to him when he was putting the nets out. And then obviously his view had been shifted in that moment to see that Jesus could abundantly provide. Um, we see that Simon realizes Jesus is able to, um, oh, that Jesus is um, calming his, his fears around his sinfulness and leaving all the fish. Uh, lastly, lastly, we see that Simon leaves all of his possessions behind. It says everything. So we again flesh that out. What would everything mean? You know, everything might, would mean that large catch of fish that he just got. Um, and we're not sure how many fish, it's not numbered, but the amount of the wage that would come in from that would be considerable. It's like, you know, winning the lottery and then not picking it up. So, that's pretty big. Then he's got all of his possessions. He's got his boat, his gear, he's got what's familiar, his, like, community, everything that he's known, he's actually just leaving it behind. So something massively significant has happened in Peter's life in this one instance and in this miracle. So then we stop there and we look at another um, interactive um, or interpretive question. And we're, again, doing this usually in smaller groups. So there's lots of different uh, voices coming into it. We see here that um, the question is, what is significant about Simon's first and then second response to Jesus? Because there's quite a difference. So we see the first thing that, Je that Simon says, after Jesus says, put out into the deep water, you've just cleaned your nets, but try again. Um, Simon says, answers, Master, we have worked all night, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I'll let down your nets. So the, his first response, Simon holds some pride in his expertise. He's like, but we've already done this all night. There's a sense of pride in his expertise, but who could blame him? This is what he does every single day. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And so we see there's a willingness to listen to Jesus. There's a willingness to listen to his instructions, even though they make no sense. We've, we've figured this out to a T. Um, fishing in deep water does not yield anything. There's a willingness to him. His willing obedience leads to a new revelation of who Jesus is. His willing obedience leads to a new revelation of who Jesus is. But his willing obedience is not the same as belief. He's just willing to try it. He's willing to listen and try it. And from that willing obedience, he also then sees the fruit, the abundance that's too extravagant to comprehend. 
So there's something in that for us. Where are we struggling to believe? Maybe there's a call to of something, it's something uncertain in our lives. But God asks us, will you trust me? Is there a willing obedience before it makes sense? Is there a willing obedience before we see the yield of abundance? Is there something, is there that ability to say, yes, I will listen, even though I don't know it will do any different, make any difference? The second response, so we see the first response, some pride in his expertise, but also willing to listen. His second response, Simon Peter saw the abundance and fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And then later his response is that he left everything to follow. So we look at that second response, and we see that Simon Peter sees, because he sees Jesus in a new way, and believes now that Jesus is more than someone who holds general authority. He's not master anymore. He's saying, Lord, go away from me. And you'd think that if you won the lottery, you'd actually feel super joyful and you'd be excited, like, wow, look at this. And instead, his response is, oh, he sees his lack. He sees that he is unworthy. He sees that Jesus holds great authority like a God whose holiness exposes sinfulness. It could be a stretch to say that Simon Peter knows he's the Son of God. Quite a stretch. But he knows that there's something different about Jesus because of his encounter with him. And he then sees how much inside of him does not look like Jesus. Right? There is a contrast between the two. So Simon leaves everything behind because his new understanding of Jesus comes with an invitation to live a new <coughs> life full of abundance. He's like, if this Jesus can do this, like what seems so unlikely, and he's giving me an invitation to be with him, like to be with him, well, I gotta take that up. I don't like it was like too good to be true, that invitation. Again, fisherman, hard job, lowly status, not much going for him. But it's what he knew. Maybe he was good at it, not quite sure. But it was what he knew. And in this instance, he sees that Jesus, though he has no clue what his new life will be, leaving everything behind, Jesus has something more <coughs> that he wants. And so he leaves all to follow. So, going back to the main question, at this point we would regroup, um, my students would give, a student leader would give like a summary of what had, what we've like pulled out from the scripture. And in this case, we find that like bringing through a little bit of a summary helps. So, a disciple is, based on scripture, and again, not exhaustive, a disciple is chosen by Jesus. Right? Simon was approached. He was really... So Jesus just walked onto his boat. Um, a disciple is taught by Jesus. So he was taught by the actual teaching that Jesus was doing to the crowd, but he was also taught in this, uh, in, in this exchange uh, of a miracle and what would happen. He was taught in a very practical way. A disciple is willing to obey, willing to try something they, don't, they can't understand. Willing there, a disciple is amazed by abundance, the abundance of Jesus. A disciple is made aware of his or her sin, that there's this awareness that comes over us when we're with Jesus, the things that we lack. But also then given a new name or a new purpose, a remembrance um, that we're not stuck in the unworthiness, that we're called out of that, we're called into something that looks like Jesus, something to be like him. A disciple is comforted by Jesus. <coughs> Do not be afraid. You don't know much of what's going to happen in your future life, but you're with me. Do not be afraid. Um, a disciple is called to leave everything. <coughs> and continue, a disciple is continuously with Jesus. And I think that one is the most exciting and the most joyful 
is to know that a disciple gets to follow the best leader. So, to wrap it up, it's important to know and remember what makes a disciple. When we are not willing to trust God, who are we really following in that time? So, Peter could have just said, no, Jesus, like, you don't know much about fishing. We're cleaning the nets and going home to go to bed. And in, in all honesty, sometimes when an invitation has come, I've chosen something more comfortable. But we see here that Simon actually chooses to try it. Right? There's that sense of openness. So when we're not willing to trust God, who are we really following in those moments? When our pride convinces us that we know best, we miss out on the abundant life of being Jesus' disciple. Jesus looked for people of lowly status often because there was an openness to believe for something more. So what does it mean for us to have our hearts in a lowly status, to have a posture of humility where we say, Jesus, we don't know what's best. We don't know what's up from down sometimes. Can you teach us? Can you lead us? We want to follow you. So, there's a couple responses, and um, at this time, usually what we do is we give students a chance to talk about application in their life. Um, I thought maybe we could do this in like a silent reflection format, which would be just like a couple minutes of looking at these three questions. I would choose, like maybe just pick one. Um, the questions are, what is the deep water Jesus is asking you to cast your nets into? Or another way of putting it, what is unknown in your life that requires obedience, even if you're doubting? The second question is, what fears surface when you think about those unknown things in your life? Are you willing to trust him? And the third one is, what ways have you experienced God's abundance in the past? How has God surprised you when you followed him previously? So we'll just take a couple minutes. I'm sorry if it feels a little strange or awkward. Um, but take a couple minutes and pick one of those and we'll all reflect together. God, we thank you that your word um, is able to instruct us in our life, that you, your word has power um, to reveal Jesus to us, um, and that your word has the ability to uh, well up inside of us that we want to respond, yes, yes, Jesus. We pray, Father, for the ways that our fears get in the way um, and keep us from wanting to say yes to you, Jesus. I pray that you would bring those fears to a place of concreteness so that we can address them, expose them, and confess them before you, Jesus. And that we can walk joyfully as your followers, as your disciples. We can walk joyfully um, knowing that you are the best leader and that you are good and that you are committed to continue to be good, a good leader for our lives. So we thank you and we praise you, Jesus. 
The application of this time with you today is that I get to talk to you a little bit about how this kind of Bible study is impacting students. And it's really exciting. Now, I've only been with students uh, for the past month or so, so I have a few stories, but not a ton of stories. Hopefully, the next time I come to visit, there'll be a lot more stories. Um, some of the things that we see on Campus Life as we do uh, this kind of study is um, evangelism is happening at the same time as discipleship. So I mentioned earlier we have um, two nights a week of Bible study going on on res floors. Right now, both of those studies are actually happening by students, um, the hosts, the people opening up their floor, are, do not believe in Jesus. They do not yet um, you know, call him Lord. But they're very curious and interested. And so we're really excited to see that because um, it, it really fosters more and more students to come, their friends who also don't know Jesus, but have questions. It's not just Christian students coming to this Bible study. There's actually quite a few that are asking questions but haven't made a decision. And so we come into that space knowing, well, like any, any moment, whatever the time is, we could see this student meet Jesus for the first time and what joy that is. So um, that's one thing I can say is that um, our students, Henry and Hiromi, um, they are both seeking the Lord really diligently. And one is going back to Japan, actually, at the end of this year. She was just on exchange. And so we're asking the question, God, how are you going to continue this when she's across the world? What are you going to provide for her that will continue to water and grow the seeds? Because we're only a part of it. And so we see that evangelism, students are meeting Jesus, but also being discipled into who Jesus is at the same time. Um, just last week, yeah, it was just last week, um, another uh, student, Andrew, uh, gregarious guy, he's, he's an international student from China. He, uh, he'll be with, uh, I'm working on Carleton campus, by the way. Um, he will be here for four years. And he attended our Thanksgiving dinner because we try to do that, especially for international students, people that can't go, away for, um, go home. We try to do like Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, and have it into our homes. And um, he was just this like super open kid that just wanted to be involved in everything. And so we saw Andrew one day in the cafeteria. I don't have an office. I hang out in the cafeteria and any of the other places where the students are. And uh, we called him over. We're like, Andrew, come and eat with us. And as I'm chatting with this one student, Andrew's over here chatting with another, and I hear out of the corner of my ear, Andrew's saying, you know, this, I just want to know, I want to learn about Jesus. Like, do you think we could study the Bible? And I wanted to hint that that was easy, but, you know, like, <laughs> it's just like such hunger. Like, he was just so open about it. And in all honesty, sometimes I live with the fear that, you know what, people have had bad experiences and have baggage around church, and so I can't say Jesus. And I can't say Bible, and I can't say some of these other words. But you know what? It's actually not very true, especially about the millennial uh, student life right now. Oftentimes, most of them have not had much encounter with the Christian faith. Um, so they have actually been removed enough that they don't have baggage, they just have questions. So we need to be bold to ask them, well, what do you think? Do you want to come to a Bible study? And uh, so Andrew came to our Bible study. We gave him a Chinese Bible, and like he got it and was like automatically opening it to read it. And uh, just this past week, he's like, I want to pray for the group. And so he prays and he thanks God that he has this opportunity to study the Bible with other people that know Jesus. Pray for Andrew. It's awesome. Like He really wants to know who this Jesus guy is, and we get four years with him. So it's awesome that we'll get to walk with him through that time. Um, but, you know, there's not that much resistance on campus. There's a lot of hardship and a lot of obstacles, just like we face in our life. Um, but it's all concentrated one age group on this campus, right? So they're all facing, you know, the looming um, deadlines of, am I going to find a career in my field with all of this debt? Right? Am I going to actually, first years, they're just ter terrified to get through their midterms and their exams. Um, you know, and, and it's things like that where a sense of community 
is also what we provide. So it's not just the Bible studies, which is like, you know, a little bit more methodical as you see today. Um, it's our student leaders are opening their home. We have a student house that's a 10 minute walk from campus. And the, those student leaders, there's five of them, they live together, they invite their friends or their new friends, people they don't know, they hang out all the time. It could be anything from a theme party to something just really chill and relax. They, they, do, they do it all. They're like, they'll use their social media, hey, I'm in the library studying right now, you wanna come and hang out? And the whole group sees it, and people can come and join. Right, so there's, there's, it's beautiful to see students stepping up into leadership as well and recognizing, I don't have to have credentials. I just get to make new friends. I just get to be me and to talk about why Jesus matters. And through that, we're seeing people like Andrew hang out and ask questions and pray for us. So that's been pretty great too. Um, I'm gonna conclude with just uh, a little bit about my role. Um, so I just recently uh, come on as a campus minister. Um, I left the YMC in April and I uh, did my preparation uh, partnership building through the summer and fall and was sent just recently um, on campus in, in October. And uh, the things that I will be doing is mentoring student leaders. We're in a time where there's quite a few of our student leaders um, that will be going, um, either like uh, graduating or going off to exchange programs next year. So I'm already in the, okay, let's see the first and second years, who can I walk alongside? Who would be the next leaders? And so meeting with them, getting to know them, building, uh, building trust with them. Um, just three days ago, I sat with a girl who um, just openly shared about her struggle with, uh, with addiction um, and how she's starting to find victory in that addiction. And just the openness to walk alongside someone. Yeah, like, you know, I, wanna, I want to check in with you regularly. Um, she has such leadership potential. And yet there's these real things that will try to snuff out. Um, students' potential and their ability to lead. So I will be uh, recruiting and training up six to eight leaders and um, student leaders, and at the same time, be thinking through strategies on how to reach more students, so a greater population that may not know Jesus. Um, and uh, specifically, we're also seeing a large group of international students get very interested in our group. And InterVarsity has the ability to branch off and have an InterVarsity uh, branch that's specific, so you can do ministry a little bit more culturally sensitive. We don't have it on Carleton yet, so there's lots of opportunity as things grow and develop to actually see a whole international group uh, rise up from, uh, from InterVarsity's presence on campus. Um, and so that's a little bit about what I'm doing. Um, I invite you to join me in making disciples on campus. You're a part of this. You're supporting me um, in, in, in encouragement and through the church. I'm so thankful to be a local missionary. Mm -hmm. If you have questions or you want to know more, I will be at the back, and I'd love to hear how things are going for you, too.